Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending the COVID-19 updates. I greatly appreciate it. It's presented by AgSafe. Um, let's get started. Um, if you should have any questions, you are more than welcome to send them to safeinfo at agsafe.org or to ruby at agsafe.org. Um, I will be happy to answer your questions. Sometimes it could be a little difficult because I have only one screen right now to answer questions via chat. Um, again, if you do have questions, please reach out to AgSafe directly. Thank you, and let's get started. So just a quick um, webinar disclaimer, if you can please go through that, I would greatly appreciate it. And we'll continue with the web disclaimer. Today's webinar and the content was produced and supported from the Western Center of Agricultural Health and Safety with the financial support from the Labor Workforce Development Agency. Webinar objectives today, review of supplemental paid sick leave of 2022, review changes to the emergency temporary standard, employer responsibilities for COVID-19 management in the workplace, revisions to your company's COVID-19 written program. And the ETS was updated on April 21st, 2022. Employees are encouraged to review the full text of the updated ETS. Um, I printed it out. There are 25 pages. Um, definitely a lot of content. And some of it has not changed. And there are some items that have been changed. And we'll address them later on in this webinar. Review of Supplemental Paid Sick Leave. Effective February 19, 2022, covered employees in the public or private sector who have employer who employees who have employers with 26 or more employees are entitled up to 80 hours of 2022 COVID-19 related paid sick leave. From two separate banks of leave, each of up to 40 hours. The first bank of COVID-19 supplement paid sick leave, and again, up to 40 hours, is available and is covered. Employees are unable to work or telework. The second bank of COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave, up to 40 hours, is available only if an employee or a family member of whom they are providing care tested positive for COVID-19 from January 1, 2022 through September 30th, 2022, immediately upon an oral or written request to their employer, with up to 40 of those hours available only when an employee or family member tests positive for COVID-19. The first bank of COVID-19 supplement paid sick leave up to 40, again, up to 40 hours is available to covered employees unable to work or telework. There is no order to which bank the employee receives sick pay from. The second bank of COVID-19 supplement paid sick leave, again, up to 40 hours is available only if the employee or a family member for whom they're providing care test positive for COVID-19. The first bank, a full-time covered employee may take up to 40 hours of leave if the employee is unable to work or telework for any of the following reasons. Vaccine related, the covered employee is attending a vaccine or booster appointment for themselves or a family member 
and cannot work or telework because they have vaccine-related symptoms or are caring for a family member with vaccine-related symptoms. An employer may limit an employee to 24 hours or three days of leave for each vaccination or booster appointment and any consequent side effects unless a healthcare provider verifies that more recovery time is needed. That also means caring for yourself. The employee is subject to quarantine or isolation period related to COVID-19 as defined by an order or guidance of the California Department of Public Health, the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or a local public health officer with jurisdiction over the workplace has been advised by a healthcare provider to quarantine or is experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis and also caring for a family, child, parent, spouse, registered domestic partner, grandparent, grandchild, or sibling. The covered employee is caring for a family member who is subject to a COVID-19 quarantine or isolation period or has been advised by a healthcare provider to quarantine due to COVID-19 or is caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed or unavailable due to COVID-19 on the premises. So again, the third one, what you could possibly see is a childcare facility being closed if they have their staff is positive. Sometimes they will close a childcare facility in that case. Um, as of right now, I haven't heard of any schools. So. Um, the second bank, a full-time covered employee, may take up to additional 40 hours of leave if the employee is unable to work or telework for either of the following reasons. The covered employee tests positive for COVID-19. The covered employee is caring for a family member who tested positive for COVID-19. And remember that family member includes child, parent, spouse, registered domestic partner, grandparent, grandchild, or sibling. Part-time covered employees. An employee may take leave up to the amount of hours they work over two weeks with half of those hours available only when they or a family member test positive for COVID-19. If an employee took leave for one of the reasons identified above between January 1st, 2022 and February 19th, 2022, and that leave was either unpaid or compensated at a rate less than the employer's regular rate of pay, the employee may also request a retroactive payment. Payment is at the employee's regular or usual rate of pay, not to exceed 511 per day and 5,110 in total. Part-time covered employees with variable schedules, please see the link below. If you need further assistance, you can also call AgSafe. The Q&A on this link below will give you several examples of part-time employees who do not work what would be a regular 20 a week schedule. So they have various, they work two, they work three, they work six. So again, going to that website will give you better understanding for those employees who do not have a set part-time schedule that are working variable schedules what time period does gen does 2020 2022 covid-19 supplement paid sick leave cover january 1 2022 through september 30th 2022 although the law was signed on february 9th 2022 the requirement for an employer to provide 2022 covid-19 supplemental paid sick leave does not start until February 19, 2022. The requirement to provide 2022 COVID-19 COVID supplemental paid sick leave will end on September 30th, 2022. If the law expires while a covered employee is taking this leave, the employee can finish taking the amount of 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave they are entitled to receive. 
So for example, if you have an employee who is sick and and it's, it just so happens it's the end of the month and there's two days before the month ends and they're going to be out an additional three more days and that's going to fall into the month of October, they are entitled to receive their paid sick leave. Twenty twenty two COVID nineteen supplemental paid sick leave is retroactive to January one, twenty twenty two, which means that covered employees who took qualifying leave between January one and February nineteen, twenty twenty two, can request payment for that leave if it was not paid by the employer in the amount that is required under this law. Payment is only required if the covered employee makes an oral or written request to be paid for that for the leave that qualifies vaccine related, caring for yourself, caring for a family member. The oral or written request must be made on or after February 19, 2022. After the employee makes the request, the employer will have until the payday for the next full pay period to pay the retroactive 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. On that payday, the employer must also provide accurate notice on the itemized wage statement of how many 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave hours have been used by the covered employee. Exclusion pay under the emergency temporary standard. An employee receives an exclusion payment when there is exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace and the employee is excluded from work. Employees are not required to use 2022 supplemental paid sick leave hours before receiving exclusion pay. For further information, please visit California Department of Industrial Relations under exclusion pay under the emergency temporary standard. So again, you have a location that is closed for XYZ reason and the employees, and it's not closed because of a specific, or it's closed and specific employees who are not sick and are able to work, but are unable to work because a location for XYZ reason will need to be closed. To look under, under exclusion payment, because they are not required to use supplemental paid sick leave. Remember, effective February 19, 2022 covered employees in the public or private sector who have employers with who have employers with 26 or more employees are entitled up to 80 hours of 2022 COVID-19 related paid sick leave from two separate banks of leave and each of them up to 40 hours. If you, the employer, does not pay sick hours, or if you retaliate, an employee can exercise their labor rights, such as filing a wage claim for non-payment of sick leave, and as a result, is fired, suspended, demoted, or have their hours reduced, this is considered retaliation. They can file a retaliation claim with the Labor Commissioner's Office. Can an employer require documentation if the employee is requesting retroactive pay for the 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave that is available only if the employee or qualifying family members was positive for COVID-19? Yes, if the employee is requesting retroactive pay for leave that is available only if the employee or qualifying member was positive for COVID-19, an employer may request documentation. This documentation could include, among other things, a medical record of the test result, an email, or text from the testing com company with the results, a picture of the test result, or a contemporaneous text or email from the employee to the employer stating that the employee or a qualifying member tested positive for COVID-19. Can an employer require certification from a healthcare provider before allowing a covered employee to take the leave when the request is for a qualifying reason? 
Generally, no. So that's the difference. This one's a qualifying reason. The other specifically test positive COVID-19 related. An employer may not deny a worker 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave based solely on a lack of certification from a healthcare provider. A covered employee is entitled to take 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave immediately upon the covered employee's oral or written request. Does the 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave law address specific situations in which an employer may request documentation before paying the employee? Yes, in several situations, the employer can seek documentation before paying an employee if an employee is using the COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave that is only available for a positive test. In such circumstances, the employee must provide the test results upon the reasonable request of the employer. If the employee fails to provide the result of the test, then the employer may deny pay for any leave taken. When an employee uses more than three days or 24 hours of a single vaccine appointment and recovery from any related side effects, an employer may seek medical certification that the employee required more time to recover from those side effects. Medical certification is this context would likely be a note from a healthcare provider that the employee or family member continue to have vaccine side effects. Is a particular type of COVID-19 diagnosis test required in order to qualify for a leave based on having positive test results? No. An employee may take an over-the-counter rapid test antigen or a test that is scheduled at a testing facility. The law does not specify type of test and does not place conditions on how the test is administered in order to qualify for leave. Can the employer require an employee to get a COVID-19 test under the 2022 COVID-19 Supplemental Paid Sick Leave Law? Yes, in certain circumstances, the 2022 COVID-19 Supplemental Paid Sick Leave Law provides that an employer may require a test after five days have passed since the employee tested positive for COVID-19. If the employee fails to take such a test required by the employer, the employer may deny pay for any leave taken after the time the employer provides the test. Any test required, the employer must be made available by the, by the employer and at no cost to the employee. Making a test available means ensuring that ensuring the employee has a rapid test in hand or securing an appointment at a testing facility for the employee. A test has not been made available by the employer if it has not been received by the employee. Now in regards to the emergency temporary standard changes, um, so we did have several changes prior. The COVID-19 prevention emergency temporary standards remain in effect. The workplace standards were updated. And again, they were updated December 2021. And again, we saw revisions in January 14, 2022. And again, on February 28, 2022, March 1st, 2022. And now that... Um, revisions that will be in effect on May 6, 2022. And again, more information, um, you can go to the website. We're also still waiting for the ETS Q&A to come out. As of this morning, I did not see it unless someone on the panel can tell me that they have, but I have not. Um, so we're still waiting for those areas that people still may have questions on and to maybe get a clearer picture of, of what's going on. Updated changes to the emergency temporary standard go into effect May 6 and expire on December 31st, 2022. The following changes 
Um, again, you have physical distancing, you have what's in red, cleaning and disinfecting, that was updated. Respirators, face coverings was updated. Testing was updated, uh, returning employees to work and outbreaks. Physical distancing. So um, yes, the requirement to install partitions has been removed. So if you haven't installed partitions, you no longer need to. And if you have partitions, can they be removed? They can be removed. Um, but as the employer, the employer is still responsible for safe working conditions and protocols to prevent limit exposure. Having a partition in place is another layer of protection for the employee. Physical distancing during, a, during an outbreak, three or more employees in an exposed group. Employers are required to evaluate whether physical distancing or barriers are necessary to control the transmission of COVID-19. Physical distancing must be used in a major outbreak with 20 more employees in an exposed group for all employees, regardless of vaccination status, except when an employer demonstrates that maintaining six feet of distance is not feasible. When it is not feasible to maintain six feet of distance, persons must be as far apart as feasible. Nothing in the revised ETS prevents employers from implementing additional protective measures that are required, including the use of physical distancing and barriers. Employers are under an ongoing requirement to assess workplace hazards and implement controls to prevent transmission of disease. There may be circumstances in which employers determine that physical distancing is necessary in their workplace. Close contact regardless of use of face coverings unless close contact is defined by regulation or order of the California Department of Public Health. So definitely look for them for more definition in regards to physical distancing. Now, in regards to cleaning and disinfecting requirement, that has also been in, removed in general and including, that includes housing and transportation. The ETS does say that they recommend you and that you must go to California Department of Public Health and your local health department for cleaning and disinfecting to be defined. ETS removed it but they're saying now you need to look at the California Department of Public Health and your local health department. So you have a worst case scenario. ETS says if you should have a positive employee. So again, ETS is saying you no longer need to disinfect. You need to look at California Department of Public Health and local health department. But if should you have a positive case, uh, within one business day of the time the employer knew or should have known of a COVID-19 case, the employer shall give written notice in a form readily understandable by employees that people at the work site may have been exposed to COVID-19. The notice shall be written in a way that does not reveal any personal identifying information of the COVID-19 case and in the manner of the employer normally uses to communicate employment related information. Written notice may include, but is not limited to personal service, email or text messaging. If it can be reasonably be anticipated to be received by the employee within one business day of sending, the notice shall include the cleaning and disinfecting plan required by the labor code. So again, ETS, no longer says you need to go to California Department of Public Health, go to your local health department, but should you have a breakout, you are still responsible. Respirators, no, there's no changes in the respirator requirements. An employer can provide a respirator to an employee. Respirators can be effective method of protecting against COVID-19 hazards when properly selected and worn. Respirators use and encourage to provide an additional level of comfort and protection for 
workers, even in circumstances that does not require a respirator to be used. However, if a respirator is used improperly or not kept clean, the respirator itself can become a hazard to the worker. You need to take certain precautions to be sure that the respirator itself does not present a hazard. You should do the following, read and follow all instructions provided by the manufacturer on you of use, maintenance, cleaning, and care, warnings regarding the respirator's limitations, keep track of your respirator so that you do not mistakenly use someone else's respirator, and do not wear your respirator whether ev where other workplace hazards, chemical exposure, requires use of respirator. In such cases, your employer must provide you with the respirator that is used in ordinance with OSHA's respiratory protection standard. Face covering. So again, um, unvaccinated workers will no longer be enforced to wear face coverings, all indoor workplaces and, and in vehicles. Um, ETS did remove the, however, face covering requirements to remain in place, including provisions requiring face coverings in outbreaks and in employer provided transportation. That was removed and now it states, ETS remove face coverings and respirator requirements, directing employers to review the California Department of Public Health and local health department recommendations. Remember, the employer is responsible for having policies to eliminate or minimize transmission, transmission and vehicles effectively. So again, ETS is saying you don't need to. And for you to go to the California Department of Public Health and also your local health department, but should there be, you still have to have your policies in place because if there should be a breakout, again, you, the employer, are responsible. Employers provide face coverings and, and ensures that they are worn when required by orders from California Department of Public Health. In addition, employees can request face coverings from the employer at no cost to the employee and can wear them at work regardless of vaccination status without fear of retaliation. So the new definition of face covering includes an example of acceptable face covering, tightly woven fabric or non-woven material of at least two layers. The ETS removed that does not let light pass through when held up to a light source. Um, what is being said, what is being stated in red is that face coverings are still a solid piece of material. Um, so face coverings do not need to completely block out light. This is just one example of an acceptable face covering made from a tightly woven fabric or a non-woven material. Holding a face mask covering up to a light is also a good way to see if there are any or very small holes or perforations that would not normally be visible. So again, a face covering is a solid piece of material as how the ETS is stating it. There was a question asked if this um, webinar and the slides will be available. Yes, they will. Everyone who signed up if, will receive this presentation. And so they'll receive it, if I'm not mistaken, sometime this week, if not next week, but everyone will receive the presentation in the email that was received. So review changes to the emergency temporary standards. We continue with that. Testing. Employers must offer testing at no cost to employees during pay time off. So that has not changed. You and well, it was before for symptomatic unvaccinated. Now it's for all symptomatic employees, regardless of whether there is a known exposure. This is the same as the previous version of ETS. So now it's all symptomatic employees, not relating who's vaccinated, who's unvaccinated. It's everyone. All employees, regardless of vaccination status, who have close contact with COVID-19 cases, except for recently um, recovered employees. So now instead of recovered employees, they have a new term called a return case. So that would be an employee who was out because of COVID-19 and then comes back and is exposed again. 
there'll be more language on the return case. I'll give another example. All employees except for recently recovered employees, regardless of vaccinating status, is an outbreak or a major outbreak. When following California Department of Public Health isolation and quarantine guidance to keep employees working or return them sooner if tested. So what does returned case mean? A COVID-19 case who returned to work and did not develop any COVID-19 symptoms after returning, a person shall only be considered a return case for 90 days after the initial onset of COVID-19 symptoms, or if the person never developed COVID-19 symptoms for 90 days after the first positive test, if a period of other a period other than 90 days is required by the California Department of Public Health regulation or order, that period shall apply. So again, this is that gray area that we're hoping that the Q&A will give us better explanation or be able to answer if we should have any questions in the future of exactly, you know, if, in regards to a return case. Testing, when an employee tests positive, requirements apply to all employees regardless of vaccination status, previous infection and lack of symptoms. Employees who test positive for COVID-19 must be excluded from the workplace for at least five days. Isolation can end and employees may return to work after five days if symptoms are not present or are resolving and a diagnostic specimen collected on day five or later test negative. If an employee is unable or chooses not to test and their symptoms are not present or are resolving, isolation can end and the employee may return to work, may return to the workplace after day 10. So again, to meet the return work criteria set forth in this subsection, COVID-19 tests may be self-administered and self-read only if other means of independent verification of the results can be provided. A time-stamped, you know, the time-stamped photograph or the, the results. So again, we're hoping that Kalisha will come out with their Q&A to clarify what this will look like. You know, if you do have someone who needs to return to work and they're testing at home, self-read, what exactly does the time-stamped photograph of the result mean? You know, what documentation is going to be acceptable in regards to the time-stamped? When an employee tests positive, requirements apply to all employees, regardless of vaccination status, previous infection, or lack of symptoms. If an employee has a fever, isolation must continue and the employee may not return to work until the fever resolves. If an employee's symptoms other than fever are not resolving, they may not return to work until their symptoms are resolving or until after day 10 from the positive test. Employees must wear face coverings around others for a total of 10 days after the positive test, especially in indoor settings. Employees who are exposed to someone with COVID-19, you have quarantine. Employees who are exposed to someone in COVID-19, non-quarantine required, um, please go um, to review further information, California Department of Industrial Relations, quarantine and no quarantine under the emergency temporary standard. And when you're done reviewing that, obviously go to your county um, and your health department. There is a lot of information in regards to quarantine and non-quarantine, and they give you several examples. Because every organization is different and what you have in your policies you know, they have what is recommended, you have the ETS, what they're saying, and then they say, go look at the California Public, California Department of Public Health, and then they say, go to your county. So again, it's having all three of those, regu those agencies and reviewing what information that they have. 
outbreaks. The revised ETS still requires employers to implement more protective requirements if an outbreak or major outbreak occurs in the workplace. Cal OSHA also has the option of proposing changes to the ETS. And I believe this was their last time, if I'm not mistaken. Employers must make testing available at no cost and during paid time to all employees within, the expo within an exposed group. There are exceptions. Um, and again, please review the ETS to review those exceptions. Um, in an outbreak, three or more COVID-19 cases among employees in an exposed group within a 14-day period. Employers' requirements in a major outbreak, 20 or more COVID-19 cases in an exposed group within a 30-day period. What is, it, what is an exposed group? All employees at a work location, working area, or common area at work where an employee COVID-19 case was present at any time during an infectious period. A common area at work includes bathrooms, walkways, hallways, aisles, break or eating areas, and waiting areas. Again, there are more, um, more information in regards to what they consider an infectious work area or period, I'm sorry. Um, and please go to the ETS. And again, we're hoping that in the next week or so, we'll have those Q&As available. And when that does become available, we will also be sending that out via email to everyone. Employer responsibilities. What notice must employers provide to covered employees about 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave under California law? Under California law, employers are required to display the required poster about 2022 COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave in a place at the work site where employees can easily read it. If an employer's covered employees do not frequent a workplace, the employer may satisfy the notice requirement by dismounting notices through electronic means. So maybe it your email, send out a mass email, or you can also put it in a, as a payroll stuffer. But this is what the form looks like if you don't, haven't already seen it. Um, again, this is what new hires should be receiving and what your, prior to your new hires, everyone should be receiving that qualify that says employers who have 26 or more employees. Again, there's the link for English and also a link for Spanish. Employer responsibilities, employee training requirements. Um, believe it or not, we still have, I've gone to many presentations, um, have gone out to see many customers and there are still employees who, employers who do not have who do not have trainings and they don't have a policy in hand for COVID. Or if they do, it is very vague. Um, so what is COVID-19 and how does it spread? It is a contagious respiratory illness caused by a virus. It can spread from person to person between people in close contact. The air that comes from our lungs when exhaling through droplets, when talking, sneezing, or singing spreads the virus. The virus spreads mostly when people breathe in. So again, as much as we would like COVID to go away, unfortunately, it is still around and we still have to make sure the safety of the employees is that we're still following those rules. Hand washing, another way to slow the spread is by hand washing. Frequently, use soap and water for 20 seconds. Dry with disposable paper towels. If not available, use hand sanitizer until able to wash hands. Provide information on location of hand washing stations and processes for replenishing supplies. So it was updated on April 20, 2022 that the California Department of Public Health is in line with the CDC's announcement that it's ordering requiring masking on public transportation and at transportation hubs is no longer in effect. 
effective immediately. California's requirement for masking on public transit and transit pubs it was terminated, but California Department of Public Health strongly recommends that individuals in these settings continue to wear masks. So again, it's making sure that you have those three agencies, what's going on, that it's updated, and you have them present and in front of you. So that way you're not missing some, you know, you're not missing, you know, an important part of what you should have implemented in your workplace. Face coverings are another way to stop the spread of COVID-19. Face covering means a surgical mask, a medical procedure mask, a respiratory worn voluntarily, or a tightly woven fabric or a non-woven. So it meant it's of solid material of at least, they say two layers, use face coverings adequately, cover both nose and mouth. I still see in different organizations that people are not wearing their mask properly. So is it something that you know, that your organization will implement or not implement. A review company protocol for providing face coverings in your workplace. Face coverings are not respiratory protective equipment. COVID-19 is an airborne disease. N95s and more protective respirators protect the user from airborne diseases, while face coverings primarily protect people around the user. Respirators. Employers policies for providing respirators and the right of employees who are not fully vaccinated to request a respirator for voluntary use without fear of retaliation at no cost. And again, your respirators for those who are vaccinated or unvaccinated, regardless. Review um, to properly how to properly wear the respirator and how to perform a seal check according to manufacturer's instructions each time one is used. And that the fact that the facial hair interferes with the seal. So letting them know that if, if you're gonna wear a respirator, that to make sure that you don't have facial hair that will be covering the seal because it will not seal if you do have facial hair. And relating, you know, those good tailgates that employees should be having in regards to symptoms, reminding employees whether we whether you have it posted in common areas, you're having them at your tailgate meetings. There are, again, different companies that have tailgates once a week, quarterly, bi-monthly, every other Friday. But remember to relay the message in regards to the symptoms of COVID-19 in your workplace. Um, common symptoms of COVID-19 may include coughing, cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, fever or chills, muscle or body aches, vomiting or diarrhea, new loss of taste or smell, and they can range from mild to severe illness and appears two to 14 days after they've been exposed to the virus. So again, it's relaying that information, having that communication with the employees on what to do if they do experience symptoms. And we know that sometimes symptoms can also possibly be symptoms of something else that's going on, but it is important for the initial contact with the employer from the employee that the employee is tested just to rule that out. But to stay home if you're experiencing any of the symptoms of COVID-19, follow your company policy for calling in sick, provide details specific to your business, call four-person lead supervisor HR, and provide phone numbers. So again, you are making sure that the employee has all the information to communicate well with whom they need to communicate when they're going to be out sick. And again, that can look, it never fails that either information isn't updated, you have a new person that's working for the company, now you have, um, you should have at least me anywhere from two, three, maybe even four people 
who a person who is sick who can reach out to. Emergencies happen, people, again, are out sick, someone leaves a company, but at least this way that the employee is gonna, you know, the, the employee will be heard on, you know, that they're feeling sick and they may possibly have COVID. If you suspect you have, you may have COVID-19, it is important to get tested. Company to provide details for how to get tested, refer to your COVID-19 prevention program for further information. And again, I cannot stress this enough, but there are some companies that still do not have a COVID-19 prevention program, or if they do, they have one that is very vague. Employers must develop a written COVID-19 prevention program or ensure its elements are included in an existing injury and illness prevention program. The employer must do the following in ordinance with their written program. The COVID-19 prevention program, communication with employees, identifying evaluation and correcting COVID-19 hazards, and face coverings and other controls. We've now been in COVID two years so now we have a rough, you know, in some places there, there's more information in other places, it's maybe not as known, but we know which areas that we need to look for, what areas that we may have problematic issues, um, where employees are working at, how close are they working? Um, again, so this is not new information for us. This is important information that needs to be given to employees and again I can't again I stress this enough there are people who do not have one and if you do have one is it review it from time to time making sure that the people that you have listed on your prevention program are still with the company the numbers are still good and it still references their location things change people change, processes change. So just making sure that your, your COVID prevention program matches what's in its contents in the location that it's located at. A company must provide a COVID-19 prevention program specific for each work site. Kausha provides a sample for businesses to use. So again, if you go onto their website, they have an excellent sample. It's a lot of content and you will take out what doesn't apply to your organization and you can add what does. As part of your safety training, you must review the CPP with the employees. So again, that is making sure that you're relaying, the, you're communicating with the employees, relaying the information on who they can contact, who they need to talk to if they feel sick, where they're gonna go if they need to be tested. And again, this can happen weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, quarterly, but the more times that you have, the more information you give the employees on a repeated basis, hopefully the more that they'll retain the information. Review elements of the CPP, authority and responsibility. Again, this is where you would provide who's responsible for the program, if there should be any questions, whether it be a department, um, someone specific. And remember, again, it's going through it frequently to make sure that information has not changed, that that employee that you've listed for the authority and responsibility is still an employee with the organization has overall authority and responsibility for implementing the provisions of this CPP in, our, in your workplace. In addition, all managers and supervisors are responsible for implementing and maintaining the CPP in their assigned work areas and for ensuring employees receive answers to questions about the program in a language they understand. All employees are responsible for using safe work practices following all directive policies and procedures and assisting in maintaining a safe work environment. Identification and evaluation of COVID-19 hazards. We'll implement the following in a workplace, conduct workplace specific evaluations. You can use a sample form or create your own. Document vaccination status of your employees. You can use a sample form or you can create your own. 
And remember that medical information is confidential. Evaluate employees' potential workplace exposure to all persons at or who may enter the workplace. Review applicable orders and general and industry-specific guidance from the state of California, Cal OSHA, and your local health department related to COVID-19 hazards and prevention. Evaluate existing COVID-19 prevention controls in your workplace and the need for different or additional controls. Conduct periodic inspections using a sample inspection form as needed to identify unhealthy conditions, work practices, and work procedures related to COVID-19 and to ensure compliance with your COVID-19 policies and procedures. Again, this is an outline that you can use, a checkoff list, an outline to make sure that each location has its policies and procedures in place. And that supervisors and managers have access to this information. Employee participation. Describe how employees and their representatives, if any, may participate in COVID-19 hazard identification and evaluation. Employee screening, describe how you are screening employees, direct screening when they come into work or having them self-screen prior to coming into work. Hazard correction, once hazards are discovered, provide assessment and time frame assigned to correct hazards. Identify who will correct the hazard as well and describe how the following will be accomplished. Again, I can't, this is very important because it, if you have procedures and policies in place that you are following through and making sure that the hazards are corrected and having someone sign off that who's responsible and saying, yes, we checked that off, we corrected the hazard, uh, very important. The severity of the hazard will be assessed and correction timeframes assigned accordingly. Individuals are identified as being responsible for timely corrections. Follow-up measures are taken to ensure timely that they're being corrected. Again, you can use this as your checkoff list to make sure that there was a hazard identified, it was reviewed, it was assigned to someone, and that someone corrected it, have them sign off on it, give a date, give a time frame of when you want it corrected. All that will help you to make sure that maybe someone else is over reviewing the policies and procedures. And as a reminder, oh, we had a hazard, a potential hazard in, in this location. You know, what happened? You can go back to your books to make sure that it was corrected. Control of COVID-19 hazards. Face can we provide clean, undamaged face coverings and ensure they are properly worn by employees. And again, this is for all employees, regardless of vaccination status, indoors, outdoors, and vehicles, and are required by orders from the California Department of Public Health. Any employee not wearing a required face covering will be at least six feet apart from other persons unless the unmasked employee is either, again, regardless of vaccination status. But again, these are your elements to your CPP and review what the Cal OSHA has on their website as their outline. Um, but provide specific information on how face coverings will be provided, replaced, and cleaned as needed, as well as what your policies are should your employers encounter non-employees that are not wearing face coverings. And again, there is a list of exceptions and they, you know, now since it's been lax of who there's any employee can not, doesn't need to wear a mask, but once there was, if you had a medical condition that you weren't able to breathe the right, breathe properly, that you didn't have to wear a mask. Now, we don't have to worry about that so much, but again, it's what you have in your location, in your organization, in regards to what your policies are, because at the end of the day, it is still the employer's responsibility if you should have an outbreak. Engineering controls for indoor locations, um, identify and evaluate how to maximize ventilation with outdoor air using filtration systems or other filtration units. Um, also describe how outside air or ventilation systems will mitigate risk without creating greater risk. Um, again, this is in regards to if you should have wild, wild fire and smoke issues. Um, 
again, making sure that you're answering every question that is listed on the forms for the CPP that the Kaosha has on their website. Cleaning and disinfecting, describe workplace specific measures for ensuring adequate supplies and time for it to be done properly. Information to employees on frequent scope or cleaning and disinfecting. Remember, ETS says that it's no longer necessary in general. You don't need to do it no more. And that's in also included in housing and in transportation. But again, should there be a breakout, you need to have cleaning and disinfecting material available to be used to clean an area. Describe your workplace specific measures. So again, this is that describing, should you have a, a COVID-19 case in your workplace, what will you implement? You know, what are you implementing and making sure that that is still a part of your process and your procedures. Hand sanitizing, describe site specific procedures that include evaluation of hand washing facilities, Determination of need for any additional facilities, encouraging hand washing and allowing time to wash hands at least 20 seconds, providing effective hand sanitizer and not using hand sanitizers, hand sanitizers that contain menthol. Methanol. Personal protective equipment, evaluate the need for PPE what is being used and provided as required, provide and ensure use of PPE as needed. Upon request, provide respirators for voluntary use to all employees, regardless of vaccination status and who are working indoors and or in vehicles with more than one person. Describe how employees will request them and will be encouraged to use them in compliance. So again, you can have ETS, California Department of Public Housing, the county will have their requirements and they'll say, oh, this has been eliminated, this has been eliminated, but it's, you know, recommended. And again, keeping in mind that you, the employer, are responsible for the employee. So maybe you want to continue using face coverings or disinfecting. Because again, should you have a breakout, you're responsible. Testing of symptomatic employees. We know it's all employees. We make COVID-19 tests available at no cost to all employees who have close contact in the workplace and have COVID-19 symptomatic or COVID-19 symptoms during the employee's time at work. Investigating and responding to COVID-19 cases. Again, this is a very important part of your program. Again, this is who will that one person be or two people or three people, whichever your organization plans on implementing, responsible to develop effective procedures to investigate COVID-19 cases. That includes seeking information from employees regarding COVID-19. And again, there will be there are sample forms in the Kaosha website. You can use those, you can create your own. But again, this is the investigating and reporting part of the COVID-19 cases. And it is a part of the element that is needed for your CPP program. Investigating and responding to COVID-19 cases. Ensuring the following is implemented. Employees that had close contact are offered COVID-19 testing at no cost during their working hours, excluding COVID-19 cases who were allowed to return to work per company's return to work criteria and have remained free of symptoms for 90 days after the initial onset of symptoms or for cases who've never developed symptoms for 90 days after the first positive test. The information on benefits will be provided to employees written notice within, again, we've mentioned this already, the one day of your knowledge of a COVID-19 case that people in the work site may have been exposed to COVID-19. This notice will be provided to all employees, independent contractors, and other employees at the work site during the high-risk exposure period. These notifications must meet certain criteria. So your system for communicating, ensure that 
you have effective two-way communication with your employees in a form they can readily understand and that it includes the following information. Who employees should report to when you have COVID-19 symptoms and possible hazards and how to describe the process. So again, that is where you where I mentioned, you know, you may want to have two, three people listed, emergencies happen, and maybe the first person is an unavailable. You have the second person, you have a third person. And making sure that that information is updated. We do see turnaround in different organizations where that person is no longer working with the company. So making sure that that information is updated along with phone numbers. Um, and to and have that process described. What does it look like? Employees can report symptoms, possible close contacts and hazards without fear of reprisal or procedures and policies for accommodating employees with medical or other conditions that put them at an increased risk of severe COVID-19 illness. Access to COVID-19 testing when testing is required. If required to provide testing, have a plan and process for no cost to employees and that it happens during working hours. So in your CPP plan, what does that look like? Are you making the appointment? Are they making the appointment? Are they making the appointment and you're reimbursing them? Making sure that you have that well-documented. Uh, process for no cost to employees and that it happens during work hours. Information about COVID-19 hazards, employees, including other employers and individuals in contact with or workplace, our workplace may be exposed to when it is being done and control those hazards and other COVID-19 policies and procedures. So describe other aspects of your system of COVID-19 related to communication being implemented in your workplace. Training and instructions, what training took place and documentation. So remember, State of California says if you have a training, you need to have it documented because if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So it's very important that you document training. I have been, again, I mentioned I've been around at other locations and I have organizations that are doing weekly trainings on COVID. Does it make it better? Does it make it worse? Does that mean the people are more susceptible to... Again, this is just making the, making sure that the lines of communication are open and who they need to talk to. Exclusion of COVID-19 cases, where you have cases of COVID-19 in a workplace, describe how you will limit transmission. Ensure, and again, this is still elements of your CPP. Ensure that COVID-19 cases are excluded from workplace until your return to work requirements are met. Excluding employees that had a close contact in the workplace until you return to work criteria has been met with the following exceptions. Employees who were fully, again, fully vaccinated before the close contact and who not developed COVID-19 symptoms. COVID-19 cases who return to work per your return to work criteria and have remained free of COVID-19 symptoms for 90 days after the initial onset of COVID-19 symptoms or for COVID-19 cases who've never developed COVID-19 symptoms for 90 days after the first positive test. For employees excluded from work, continuing and maintaining employees' earnings, wages, seniority, and all other employee rights and benefits. So again, you're describing how your workplace will accomplish this. And remember that it's catered to each department in your organization. Reporting, record keeping, and access. Provide your policy for reporting information about COVID-19 cases and outbreaks at your workplace to local health department whenever required by law. Provide, it, provide related information request by local health department. Maintain records of the steps taken to implement your written CPP. Make your written CPP available at the workplace to employees, authorized employee representatives, and to reps of Cal OSHA immediately upon request. Keep record of and track all COVID-19 cases. Return to work criteria, COVID-19 cases with COVID-19 symptoms will not return to work until all the following have occurred. At least 24 hours have passed since a fever of 100.4 or higher has resolved without the use of fever reducing medications. COVID-19 symptoms have improved 
and at least 10 days have passed since COVID-19 symptoms first appeared. COVID-19 cases who test positive but never develop COVID-19 symptoms will not return to work until a minimum of 10 days have passed since the date of specimen collection of their first positive COVID-19 test. A negative COVID-19 test will not be required for an employee to return to work once the requirements for cases with symptoms or cases who test positive but never develop symptoms have been met. Persons who've had a close contact may return to work as follows. Close contact but never develop symptoms within 14 days have passed since the last known close contact. Close contact with symptoms within the case with symptoms criteria have been met unless the following are true. The person tested negative for COVID-19 using a PCR COVID-19 test with specimen taken after the onset of symptoms. And at least 14 days have passed since the last known case contact and the person has been symptom free for at least 24 hours without using fever reducing medications. Um, if in order to isolate, quarantine, or exclude an employee is issued by a local or state health official, the employee will, re will not return to work until the period of isolation or quarantine has completed or the order is lifted. Um, I haven't really seen any you know, the county give out orders for quarantine. I know in the beginning it was really, I mean, they were doing it, but I know now people just go to their medical provider or if, if they should test positive, then they give them a note for work. Other resources for you to review, um, I would definitely look, if you're looking for material to have safety meetings on, um, the Western Center for Agricultural Health and Safety, excellent resources there. Um, again, and that is definitely a path that you can use to find your um, ETS, or if you don't have a COVID prevention policy in place already, or you want to update one, but you want to start all over maybe. Um, I know that they have that link available on the website and they have a lot of material. And again, the California Department of Industrial Relations, um, sometimes it could be a little more difficult to nav navigate different websites and agencies. Um, again, AgSafe also offers, if you have not had any uh, COVID-19 tabletops, they are training kits, and they're, if you look, it's a flip chart. It's in 11 by 17 in size, and the available language is English, Spanish, Hmong, and Punjabi, and you are able to order these as a maximum of six tabletops per company, but if you do need more, you can go to Safe Info at, safe info at agsafe.org, and you can ask, um, ladies in the office if you can have more and I'm sure that they will send them to you in the mail and again this are is a very helpful resource and again it's you have to have the training it's just more material for you to present it in a different way that hopefully the employees you know you're, you're giving them the same repetitive training and it just changes things up so definitely please reach out to them. And you can also order them online going onto the portal. And there's also training videos as well. So, and this is free. The tabletops are free. The training videos are free. And again, this is another way to hand out, to have a safety meeting with employees, mixing things up. So please definitely look out for those resources. You can go onto the member portal and you can order your tabletops from there. If you have any questions, you can go to safeinfo at agsafe.org. Um, again, you can, re you can request the tabletops online. There's the safety videos also online. Um, if you need more tabletops, you can request them through the safeinfo at agsafe.org website. Um, I mean, email address, I'm sorry. Um, and that's the email address if you want to request your tabletops. And that's also a phone number if you want to reach out to AgSafe and you have any questions in regards to this webinar. Um, and hopefully soon AgSafe will be sending um, everyone this webinar. 
And also, um, if we should be getting anytime soon the Q&A from the ETS, we will also be sending that out as well. Um, thank you for participating. I greatly appreciate it. Um, if anybody, again, reach out if you have any questions. And everyone have a good day. Bye-bye.